and welcome into Poke the Bear episode 55, the Johnny Boychuk episode. Big Johnny Boychuk, what the Bruins would do for that kind of guy this past season. I'm Evan Marinovsky here with Connor Ryan of Boston Sports Journal. Connor, how we doing? Evan, doing well. How you doing? I'm doing great. I am doing great. It is August, which is weird uh, that it's already this far into the year. COVID's kind of creeping its way back in. It's like, ah, did you get about me? Um, hoping that stuff is just a blip and that we can all get past it, get right on past it. Um, but this week in the Bruins world, it's been development camp. That's been the main thing. There hasn't been anything else crazy as opposed to last week, which was just thing after thing, after thing, after thing, after thing. This week is, is kind of quiet in a sense. Some teams are still making moves, you know, uh, Zach Sanford got signed out in St. Louis. There's been a few other little things. John Tortorella is going to ESPN. <laughs> that's, that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest we'll, thing. We'll be entertaining. Yeah. For the Bruins respect though, at least it's good that it's, people can focus on something that's not doom and gloom really in terms of like the David Krejci. Granted, I guess maybe the Bruins don't have the best prospect pools. So maybe I was going to say, I was, was going to say it's, it's a tough week to you know have it what, after though, the Krejci stuff. All things considered though, you still, Dev Camp's Dev Camp. It's still intrigued. There's always camp invites. There's always guys who look good, guys who look promising. And especially I think after the past year that, a lot of these kids had where they either had abbreviated seasons, they were playing overseas. I mean, there are some teams who are players who didn't even have a season. Like you had guys in the Ivy league who were kind of stuck there, who didn't really have a place to go. So just even getting these guys back on the ice was still uh, a good development, to say the least. And Johnny Beecher had a COVID issue back with the world junior mm-hmm. team. If I remember right, he was, he was he there and got sent home. There was something that happened with him where he couldn't yeah, participate. Yeah, he, he, he was at camp, and uh, I think him and his team, I think Bordalo, I think that's who it was. Um, Ooh, I think it was. It definitely yeah, was. Um, got sent back, and yeah, I mean for him it was. I, I even want to say I wasn't sure if it was like a con, like it was a first positive, then he tested negative. But I feel like there was something that I think where there was the um, the I IIHF that was like super strict about it. Obviously, with so many different countries involved, as to why he was unable to, you know, participate, um, later, but yeah, tough year for him. I mean, with that and the fact that he pretty much, you know, injured his shoulder before the season even began played through it. Um, you know, production kind of suffered as a result, then eventually had to go under the knife in February for full labrum surgery, which is not fun. It's a long recovery. So, so he's been, he's been in a red sweater, uh, for camp so far. So he hasn't been able to do as much, but still the, things you expect to see from Johnny Beecher, great skating uh, guy that you, you kind of shot out his, you know, what he could look like in the NHL still probably more of a bottom six guy. If you look at just maybe where his potential is, unless he hits another gear offensively, but lots of like about in that role uh, of what he could be in terms of an effective, you know, maybe he's, I think if he hits a higher level of his offensive ceiling, maybe you get like a, a Coleman and a player, and if not, maybe like a Coleman light, you know, like a guy who can still give you 15 goals, but in terms of his energy, what he brings, he could make an impact. But just, I think for Bruins, it's good to see him back out there and on the road to recovery and being back at Michigan uh, with a team that is stacked. Uh, stacked. I mean, he could, yeah, <laughs> that <team's> ridiculous. <laughs> he, he could pile on points anyway, just being on, you know, in the top six or the middle six, even with the way that team's looking. So should be a, a big year for him kind of, uh, you know, reset his status as one of their top prospects and hopefully kind of bounce back in a big way. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned the doom and gloom aspect and, you know, you mentioned Johnny Beecher as well being, you know, probably their most highly touted center in the prospect pool. He's a former first round pick. Um, You mentioned the doom and gloom and, you know, hearing that the the top centerman in the prospect pool on a team that's going to need prospects up the middle soon, uh, hearing that he's probably going to be, you know, project as a bottom six guy, is not the most encouraging thing in the world. Now he's very fast. And as you said, still has a lot of room to develop, you know, recovering from injury. So again, this is not a sure bet. He's not, you know, it's not sure that he's going to be a bottom six center, but that's how he projects. That's at least kind of how he projects right now. Um, one area, uh, cause I know we want to hit on surprises of dev camps, some good things of dev camp. We'll get to kind of the pressure aspect of things later uh, on a guy who, has been in many development camps, was not in it this year, but has been in many. Uh, but a, a, a nice surprise in this development camp was Mason Lorai. It was the first time that he had been on the ice really with the Bruins because he got drafted uh, in the middle of the pandemic. 
he was a third round pick, correct? Uh, last year, or was he I second? Say, I want to say second. He was okay, second. second but the, second but round their pick first from, pick of the draft. Yes, yes. Second round pick from last year, 6'4", huge left shot defenseman. What did you see out of him this week? Yeah, he's definitely a uh, very intriguing player. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest you know takeaway if you ask evaluators what, what you like about him. Um, he's still a guy that has a lot to think work on and you know, you're going to see him make that next step up in his development going over to Ohio state. Um, I think it's a lot to be excited about the production he put forward last year as an offensive defenseman in the USHL. Granted he was uh, you know, an older player in the USHL where you're, you know, piling, piling on points sometimes against uh, you know, 17, 18 year old guys, you know, <laughs> that, you know, so, I mean, it's still an achievement that he still, uh, I think was USHL defenseman of the year. I want to say still very, very gifted. I think he was a forward for most of his career. Then only made the jump. I think maybe after he got a growth spurt growth spurt. So I think, I think it was like 15, 16 is when he made the full switch. So he's got a lot of tools. Um, he's got, I mean, you notice him on the ice. He's such a big body. Um, but I, I think for the Bruins, you know, he's definitely a guy that it's to be expected that once you make that jump up to the college ranks, that there's going to be, a learning curve and for especially a defenseman where you have to kind of round out your overall game. We'll see how he does his first year, but if he's a guy that his first year and he's still, uh, he closed out his freshman year with like 15, 20 points, you know, is blogging top four minutes. I think you have to be encouraged if you're a Bru- if you're a Bruins fan of getting some, you know, good news in terms of a guy that you can shot out there. It's kind of, I think like uh, Swayman where, you know, I think he was in the USHL, the, the year the Bruins drafted him, made the jump up to college. And, um, you know, you, sometimes it's always a coin flip, right, where with goalies of how they do making going up to the college ranks. And I think you saw with him, it was a pleasant surprise of like, oh, wow, this guy, this guy's pretty good in college until you get to his his final year. You're like, this guy's unconscious right now. This guy's blowing yeah. out his team. So, again, there's it's to be expected that guys – hit a wall a little bit their first year in college. But if, if Lori, who's a bit of an older player anyway, um, can t- kind of take that next step in college. And again, it, it's tough to chart out what exactly he is in the, um, you know, in the college rank or in the NHL in terms of charting out his career. But if he's a, you know, a, a second pairing guy, an offensive guy, a guy who can help you out on the power play and he's a big body on top of it. And a guy that still needs to, you know, fill out that frame that he has, um, he could be a very intriguing option there in terms of, you know, how he could help this team in the coming years. Um, so I think from the Bruins perspective, you look at center depth, you look at forwards, obviously Fabian Lysel is not here at, at dev camp because um, he's not gotten vaccinated yet. So you don't really have the the high end skill that maybe people get excited about when you go to see a dev camp where you've got highlights of guys, you know, deking and dangling and, and having these highlight real goals. But in terms of defense, whether it be, Lori or um, I think Brady Lyle's been maybe there, one of the more impressive players they've have, who's literally, you know, a part of the roster right now is in a camp invite. Um, you know, there's at least some, uh, you know, encouragement in terms of how that decor looks in terms of guys beyond the, the usual suspects, right? Beyond the, the Zaboros and Vac and Islands. I think you're seeing these other defensemen who are kind of rising through the ranks that could, you know, I don't think they're going to be pushing for a job. Uh, in short order, but could, could be on the way soon. And I wouldn't discount Lyle. I mean, Lyle's an older player too. Um, big body, right shot, um, offensive, offensively gifted despite being a bigger guy. If the Bruins go into camp and it's, you know, just Connor Clifton at, you know, the third pairing right shot spot, you know, Lyle could either be vying for a death role on this team, or I mean, maybe he could be pushing Clifton too. I mean, he's a guy that has really kind of sold the opportunity that's been given to him. So uh, I could see him being out of everyone at dev camp, a guy who could make a legitimate push, um, you know, by, by the start of training camp for sure. Yeah. That was, what I, was gonna, I was just going to ask you if you thought Lyle could kind of make that jump to the NHL level at a good season in Providence last year. Very good, um, yeah. yeah. Very good on offensively, aside from uh, Beecher, who else has looked good to you on offense? Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of guys drafted by the team, um, I would say, uh, Trevor Kuntar, who uh, was drafted last year, um, played at BC as a freshman. Didn't Pains really know what to talk about that. <laughs> uh, it wasn't too bad for him, though. If he's, you know, as long as he's helping out the Bruins, I guess that, that's a good thing, right? No one's perfect. That's true. Taking BC. Uh, unfortunate. Um, but, you know, you look at just 
how he fit in on that team, obviously in more of a complimentary role on, on that BC team that had a lot of legit players and still, I think had, I want to say uh, 10, 10, 10 goals maybe, or maybe it was 10 points, but still for a freshman in a, in a minimal role uh, made an impact should be you know, either vying for more consistent minutes, maybe top six spot uh, this upcoming year. So uh, he's a good player who, you know, plays a little bit of bite, uh, is skilled around the net. I think a lot of his goals last year for BC were a lot of tips, uh, you know, rebounds, net front goals. So six goals, see- 10 points. Yeah, there you go. So I'm um, encouraging to see that from a freshman who's not afraid to kind of get into the the muck of it down low um, at that age, especially. So he's a guy that's uh, encouraging to watch. And then uh, in terms of other offensively gifted guys, I think you have to look a little bit beyond um, the drafted guys. You know, uh, Curtis Hall, I think, is a guy who could be due for a big bounce back year after kind of having a lost season. Couldn't go to Yale because of COVID got injured, I think one game into his Providence career. So he's a guy that should bounce back. But in terms of guys standing out in camp right now, uh, I look at, uh, you know, camp invites. You've got Mike McLaughlin, another BC guy uh, from Bill Ricca, I want to say. He's looked good. You you map out, you know, how these guys, you know, who who they could sign with as, you know, undrafted, you know, free agents. McLaughlin makes a lot of sense for Bruins where he's a local kid, uh, you know, from here, BC makes plenty of sense. Um, he's looked good. He had a really good goal, uh, on Wednesday at camp. Um, I think, you know, Mock Diver, who is the guru of, uh, you know, in terms of Providence and, you know, prospects in the Bruins system kind of like hearkened him a little bit to, uh, uh, you know, a guy like a Chari or, or a, a good energy guy on the third, on the fourth line who could, you know, does the right things, two-way player, I think he's a captain at BC now, so he could be a guy that could be in the mix. Uh, and then Ben Myers, I think, has been maybe the most consistent forward in the group. He's another camp invite um, from uh, – plays at Minnesota right now. Uh, he's had 25-plus points his first two years at Minnesota. Uh, wore the A as a sophomore last year. Um, I think Diver said that he's a guy that is going to be – the target of many teams, I think, especially after his junior year, if he wants to sign. Um, So we'll see if the Bruins uh, are a fit there. I mean, the fact that he's a camp invite is encouraging to see. That's kind of like when you saw uh, Nick Wolf get invited to Bruins dev camp, even though he's uh, a Minnesota guy played at Duluth. Um, You could kind of see that connection there. And what do you know, the Bruins signed Nick Wolf later on in his career after he's done at Duluth. So, um, Meyer's not not really a, you know I think he's like 5'10", 5'11", but energy guy but uh, good hands good finisher on the net so he could be another guy that they could target as an undrafted uh, free agent so those guys have stood out again we kind of harken it back to it's not sometimes always the most encouraging thing when the camp invites are the most you know impressive in forwards of the group so far but um, I still when you look at I think Hall and Beecher and, you know, a few of these other guys, Kuntar, who should be in a better role this year, BC. You've got a lot of guys that maybe don't have the highest ceilings, but all should be primed for either bounce back years or, you know, improved numbers as let's say a sophomore going into a a bigger role. So again, Bruins may not have the deepest farm system, but we could have four or five guys that, could have, you know, breakthrough or really impressive years, whether it be in the AHL or in the college ranks that a year from now, we could be looking at it. And again, they're not all of a sudden going to have a top 10 farm system, but we could have a few more guys on the way that uh, could be either pushing for a role next year, or you're a lot more encouraged with their progression and where you could kind of map out their career in the next couple of seasons. How's Brett Harrison looked? Cause I, I, that was a guy, I mean, obviously it's, he's the highest pick out of this past draft. For the Bruins that isn't Fabian Lysel. Um, and Lysel obviously isn't there. And I know Harrison was someone that a lot of people said was a good value pick in that third round. What have you seen out of him? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the uh you know 2021 draft guys a little bit step behind maybe the guys who've been at camp uh before. Um Harrison though you notice that he's got uh you know pretty good size for uh you know where he is at you know his age. I think he's six two maybe like 190, I want to say right now. So he's obviously still got to fill out his frame a little bit, but he's another guy that you kind of look at where he could be four or five years down the road and, and be impressed with where he is. I mean, the numbers he put together, um, you know, 
up in Canada, uh, the production he put forward before COVID kind of messed up his whole timeline. Um, he's a guy that uh, kind of like Kuntar a little bit in terms of where you map out how he could play at the next level where um, could be, you know, in and around the net, uh, you know, knocking guys around. So uh, again, you're not seeing too, too much yet of the, the 21 uh, players, but Harrison's definitely a guy. I think you, you see him in person, you can see the appeal and you know, how he fares against guys around his age group. And I think he should be poised for a big year, um, you know, going back up to Canada this upcoming season and kind of see what the next steps are for him. But he's definitely obviously Lysel far and away is the guy that you know is the headliner of that, of that drive class. I mean, he could make the argument he's a number one or number two prospect in the system right now, just based on potential, but Harrison could be uh, more than a point per game guy next year and all of a sudden elevate his game into being a, a highly regarded project in the system too. So they've definitely got more options in, in the system that again, should be hopefully putting together some really strong seasons with a hopefully normal year. Let's hope. You'd say Fabian Lysel is a pretty safe bet to be a top prospect. Um, okay. So uh, we mentioned earlier that we would get to a prospect who has a lot of pressure on them where the prospects have the most, but I really can only think of one and he's not really a prospect anymore. And that's Jack Stadnika. Because this feels like a make or break year for Stadnika. I feel like we've said we said this last year too, but this year really is because Gracie's gone. There's there's openings. There's gonna be movement down the middle. You know, we we said before Krejci even left that if Krejci did leave, what would the lineup look like? And then Krejci did leave, and we're saying, what's the lineup gonna look like? Obviously, there's Charlie Coyle, and you have Eric Holla now. Felino can play center. Uh, you know, you have Trent Frederick. Uh, is anybody else? That I'm, Curtis Lazar. You have options up and down from line two through four. Jack Studnika. What are, has there been anything said this week about Studnika at all? I feel like there hasn't been because he hasn't been there. Uh, do you think that there is a, what are the chances that a guy like Studnika steps in? Uh, or that they I even mean, trust Studnika to step yeah. in? I mean, I think it's going to depend on what they do between now and the start of camp. You know, if, uh, tomorrow when this drops and we're behind again and they trade for Christian Dvorak and that kind of answers it right or, or move like that. Um, but you could make the argument that they can go into it and see what Stanika has. Now, granted, what exactly is that role going to be, right? Because I've seen a few people mention, you know, at this point, screw it, put him in, put him on the second line with, with Hall and Smith and he'll produce, which maybe, maybe he will. I don't think, you know, Taylor Hall would be too thrilled about the fact that, he went from David Krejci to an unproven rookie in a top six role, but Taylor Hall quits. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, you kind of look at it and it's, it's fascinating to see just how much things have changed, obviously with, with David Krejci leaving and kind of the, the vacancy there that they have to fill. But just the fact that you go look back at last year where it seemed like the youth movement was well underway, where it was, you know, you had three or four guys on defense fighting for a spot. Um, you know, you had, Sidnika maybe being a, a, a middle six guy, Frederick, you know, pushing for a spot. Now you've only got a few guys kind of in that mix because the left side right now is kind of short up. So maybe Vakanainen or Zaboral pushes for a spot, but don't really know what happens there. Um, maybe Lyle pushes for a spot, but again, they have at least bodies in place there on defense right now. But then you look further up and the only two guys that kind of have a spot maybe, you know, in line for them is Frederick who, it's a pretty important spot though on that fourth line. Like you still need better production from that spot. So you hope that he can, uh, you know, if they keep him at center, like they, like Don Sweeney mentioned, that he's able to drive that a line that needs to be much better next year and is going to be very different. So a lot of pressure on him to not just be the, the guy who's either, you know, threatening to punch everyone or is annoying the bejesus out of you. You still need a guy who can drive play uh, and play a responsible game. So pressure on him. And then on Sonika, again, as you said, the Bruins have options there, but if Sonik is in their plans, it's not again a spot now where it's we'll roll you up there and you know get your feet wet, suit happens. Like, no, they need they need him if they they trust him in that spot to be driving play and getting something out of whether it be the second line or the third line that ha, you know has legitimate NHL options, you know, to his left and right. So I think you look especially at Sonika uh and, and what he can bring in camp. And I mean he's been at warrior 
after Dev Camp is wrapped up, they've had a couple of NHLers, uh, you know, skating there, including Jack Eichel. I was going to say, isn't there yeah. another future uh, Bruins yeah. centerman yeah, named Jack Christ. skating there as well? Um, but you look at Sadiq and how, you know, he looks, uh, I think, I think Diver mentioned that he's been training over in Foxborough and that he's put on quite a, quite a bit of weight, you know, good muscle. Um, he looks, he looks at from the limited reps we've kind of seen him at, at warrior, um, which is encouraging. Cause that's, I think one of the biggest keys for him is just, you know, being able to fight inside. Uh, he's never shown a, a hesitancy to, you know, get into grade a ice and fight for the puck and take some punishment along the way. But it's a lot easier to do that when also you have 10, 15 pounds of muscle tacked on the guys can't just simply push you out of the way. So, um, it, it's tough to see, to chart out what exactly the Bruins are, you know, are looking, you know, obviously they'll take any production they can. I don't know if they're putting, placing all their bets on Sadnika stepping into a two C three C role this year, but if he looks great in camp and he's pushing coil or he's pushing Eric Howla or Felino, you know, it's a good problem to have. And I think you're in a better spot overall. If, you know, we get to midway through the year and he's a, he's, penciled in at center and he's driving play you know that's a better problem than uh you know a better scenario than either having to panic and trade for a 2c this this off season or going to next year and you know we we get to january and close 2c and howl is 3c and you know sydney is on the outside looking in failing to really you know carve out a legitimate role um so for the brooms i think you're, they're going to give him every opportunity sydney to to fight for a spot there in camp. Um, but it would be a, a good break for the Bruins to say the least, if he shows kind of the promise that he put forward the last couple of years, because I think he's, he can be a talented player in the league. Um, he just has to put it all together and hopefully be given a little bit of leeway to, you know, you know, roll with the punches and, and deal with kind of the bumps in the road that come with his development. You know, if, if we get to a spot where, they open the year and Sanika is on the fourth line playing nine minutes a night and, you know, isn't able to make much of an impact. Then I don't really know what you're expecting out of him, Right. You know, let's give him a look at three C and give him a, a two, three game sample size and see what you get from that, that group, because you need to, it's kind of like the brusque, right? If the brusque is here next year, uh, I don't want him on right wing. I don't want him, you know, put him at, if you want to see what you, if you want to get something out of him, put him in at left wing where he's comfortable and see what you got. Like, there's no need to kind of, you know, knock him all over the lineup. And the same thing I think applies to Sadika. And I think also it goes, comes down to Cassidy, not pulling the trigger too quickly with these kids. I mean, I think it's pretty expected that, you know, you're going to have some production issues on that second line. If you're just going to insert coil or Sadika or Hala in with Hall and Smith, like if, if that's what you're rolling with, your, your production is going to be less. And I think Bruce Cassidy has to realize that you can't just switch lines a bunch mid game and expect something to come of it. You know, you might get some short term gains out of it, but I don't think it's anything big. You know, I don't think you're going to mm-hmm. strike gold in the middle of the second period in the middle of a game against, you know, Philadelphia in October. Yeah. I don't know if they play Philadelphia and, in October, and, and, but and it's, and it's even more tempting this year, especially with Cassidy, where you've got at least more depth and more fallback options that are veteran players. It's not like you're, all right, do we put in like Trent Frederick or do we put in like Sidnika? It's like, all right, you've got, you know, let's say DeBrusque is still there and you're sorting through in the third line. You've got DeBrusque and, you know, Howla and Felino and Coyle and all these other guys. Like you've got legitimate options there that are more appealing than going into the barrel of, you know, Providence players or, or younger players in the system to roll in that spot. You've got depth now, which is a good thing, but also could make it tougher if a guy like Sidnika stumbles out of the gate. And you mentioned it. If you put Sneak on the fourth line, he plays nine minutes a night, is irrelevant and doesn't do anything. You're plummeting his trade value. He has trade value right now. Maybe not what it was a year or two ago, but he does have trade value. And you can't rule that out. You can't rule out a Sneak trade down the road. So building up his value by, you know, keeping him in spots where he's comfortable, like center, like the second or third line, like putting him with good wingers, not the worst idea in the world. I don't hate that. Again, I, you know, you do have to see what you have in these kids a little bit, you know, a little bit. Uh, and I, I don't think putting, St- you know, again, putting Stadnika with two legit. I mean, let's say Stadnika's on the third line with Felino and Hala, right? You go with those or Debrusque De- and Felino or some kind of mishmash of those guys. 
that's not the worst thing in the world. Those are NHL players. Those are, you know, it's kind of established guys. Give it a shot there. You know, again, last year, Sadnika fell off the face of the earth after, you know, time in the top six. So it's going to be up to Bruce, uh, Bruce Cassidy and sort of the whole crew uh, down there to let him kind of get in a spot where he's comfortable in, you know, at least uh, to keep his trade value up. At the very least, keep the trade value up. I think that's kind of the the, the motto with everything. Remember last year, we were, I, I said, uh, I was like, oh, Jake Dupron is going to lead the Bruins in goals this year. Uh, you know, he's going he's gonna to have such a bounce back year. This year, I'm making no predictions. No predictions out of me. I don't it's care not. if we do a predictions episode. I'm not saying a damn word because I'm just going to jinx someone. Gonna, and my gonna prediction's going to let me bury my own grave instead, Evan. Yes. Just have me like rattle off 10 predictions that are all going to be wrong. Yes, I think we both had. St- I think I we might have both said this that Stadnika was going to like you know cement himself in the top six. He was going to be the top six right winger. <laughs> this you should make year. one prediction that they get Jack Eichel. So when you're right, we can just cut the the video and put it and paste it everywhere. Yes, well, it's I again. I I hope Jack Eichel trade rumors continue forever to the Bruins because the trade proposals are the best. That's my favorite yes. thing. Every trade proposal is is better than the last, so to speak. Um, but anyways, that is uh, Poke the Bear episode 55. Connor, before you go, what can the people look forward to over at BSJ? Yeah, we're going to obviously keep on breaking down more of uh, dev camp, more prospects. Um, you know, if we're able to get maybe a guy, you know, if Don Sweeney talks, I'm sure there'll be a lot more discussions beyond just the de- uh, rookies and development and stuff like that. There's probably a few more pressing things yeah. that will uh, be discussed. So. Uh, if that's the case, we'll, we'll uh, you know, have all that covered over at BSA. So subscribe over at bostonsportsjournal.com. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that at Connor Ryan underscore 93. Go do all that. That's Connor Ryan, Evan Marinovsky. You poke the bear listeners. Have a great rest every day.